Good morning, my name is Ruth Douglas. I'm Deputy Editor of SciDev.net um, Global Edition. Welcome to our monthly readers conference call. Um, this is really an opportunity for you, the readers, to put questions to our team of regional editors from around the world. And today we want to focus on the subject of monkeypox. Um, often we also invite guests to join us from the field of science and development. Um, but unfortunately, the, the guests that we, the technical experts that we had lined up um, to join us today uh, are unable to make it. Um, but we'd love you to um, stay and put your questions to our editors who can um, give some insight into the reporting around this subject and um, into the spread of um, the disease in the various regions that we cover. Perhaps, um, Agechi, um, perhaps we could just start with you. You're our um, editor for the Sub-Saharan Africa English edition, and you're based in Nigeria. Um, I know that you have a story in the pipeline at the moment about um, the need for greater surveillance in Sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to monkeypox. What can you what can you tell us about this and about the the um, spread of the disease in in your region at the moment? Um, so far in the region, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we have about eight countries recording cases of monkeypox. We have thirty six confirmed cases in Nigeria, ten in DRC, um, eight in Central Africa Republic, three in the Main Republic and Cameroon as well, um, and then. Um, we're also reporting cases in countries that were not typically endemic in the past, so five in Ghana and um, one in Morocco. There are also several countries that have reported case, they have reported suspected cases, so these cases haven't yet been confirmed. Um, and this is, uh, this is where um, concerns are because um, it means that in these, in these places, it means that monkeypox is then spreading farther and wider than it typically was in the past in these endemic countries. Um, and what the WHO, the World Health Organization, is saying, as well as experts, is that this can be because of uh, poor surveillance systems in these countries. Um, and then that, that means that what needs to happen in these countries um, is tightening um, the, the surveillance system and just tightening the preparedness for, in, in, in terms of managing um, infectious diseases in the region. And because that's something that the region hasn't yet got. And then experts are saying that it's important that we invest, um, we invest and strengthen um, infectious disease preparedness for infectious disease and surveillance, as well as um, ensure that even in terms of investment, from countries that are wealthier, um, equitable distribution of vaccines and treatments um, must be at the forefront of discussion. So um, basically what the efforts are saying that we must rethink pandemic preparedness in the region. And obviously um, this is a disease that has been present in, in Africa for many decades, and it must be frustrating in a way to see um, suddenly it take on this global significance and the world actually open their eyes to the need for this kind of surveillance and um, research and so on. Has there been things going on uh, over the years anyway? I mean, we, I know that you also did uh, have done a podcast recently on research um, that's happening in, in sub-Saharan Africa. What, what can you so tell us about that? You're right. Um, the monkeypox has been in sub-Saharan Africa particularly um, Nigeria, some of these endemic countries, um, for a long while, over, yeah, as you said, decades, and not much has been you know, done to eliminate or not much research has been done in, uh, in terms of well, finding out and investigating monkeypox, its transmission and all of that. And so now that the disease has spread across, uh, well, it's cross continent, um, it's beginning to gain, people are beginning to talk about it. And, and that's raising some concerns as well as to why it has to happen or as to why um, research and talks about prevention, preparedness, the vaccines and all of that are just beginning to happen now when the disease has existed or has been endemic in several countries in the region. 
another discussion that I'm seeing at the moment is about um, whether the virus should be renamed. Is this something that's being reported on in your region? Yes. Um, well, discussions are being had about uh, about on if the virus should be renamed. Um, but well, nothing has come up in that regard yet. We don't know what the name is yet. We're not, we're not sure what it will be named. But yes, there are discussions being had at the level, at the whole level, and at the ministries of health as well, um, talking about renaming the, the virus, as well as um, we're talking. We're also talking about um, Africa being able to declare um, to declare pandemics or to declare sorry to declare. Um, infectious disease of global concern like on their own being able to autonomous uh, um, on their own to independently say that um that, that they, they have an outbreak of diseases or infectious disease in the country um that's also another discussion that's being had here and of course you yourself are based in nigeria which has struggled with an outbreak since uh, 2017 i think a large, large outbreak and so what what has been happening in Nigeria in terms of strengthening um, surveillance? Um, well, in, in terms of strengthening and surveillance, I think that what has happened is that it wasn't that strong in the past, but because of COVID, there are very, several labs now, so they're um, leveraging on, on the systems that were put in place um, as a result of COVID-19 and their stress, then, so their lab, so I think there's a national lab, national lab that is able to detect cases of monkeypox in Nigeria at the moment. Okay, thanks, Agechi. Julianne, can we um, come to you? Have, have you found in your region that COVID has changed the way this um, disease is being approached? Yes, thank you, everybody. What we are we are experiencing, what we are seeing in our region here, I think that it is um, uh, it is too early to to say if uh, COVID has uh, changed something in the way uh, government are handling this disease because we know we have not uh, uh, completely finished with COVID. And this is another outbreak. And um, what is important maybe to mention regarding the situation in sub-Saharan African French uh, uh, countries is that the, the most affected countries in our country in our region is uh, DRC, uh, in I mean the Democratic Republic of Congo. In a press release published um, one week ago, uh, the Africa Bureau of uh, World, Health, World Health Organization said that Democratic Republic of Congo count almost 95% uh, of the all, of all the cases uh, registered in in Africa in the podcast that we, we have in our region we have um, asked our correspondent in uh, DLC to to uh, prepare a story a story on this situation and the story is online was published it was published uh, yesterday and in this story he said that um, as as of last week the there was all, already uh, 1200 uh, cases registered in the democratic republic of congo and 60 deaths and and he asked he uh, uh, asked the a researcher from the most important uh, most important re medical research center in DRC he asked uh, how they are handling this situation and they said that for now, there is uh, no uh, specific treatment uh, against this uh, disease, and there is no specific vaccine against this uh, against this disease. And it is uh, something that is um, uh, a pity, knowing that um, the, this disease appears in for the first time in Sub-Saharan Africa in, in 1970. So uh, they're, they're, they're almost 50 years of, uh, almost more than 50 years old, more than 50 years that we have this disease in Africa. So uh, there is not a specific treatment, there is not a specific vaccine. And these researchers told our reporter that what they are doing to, to handle this disease in DLC now is just a sort of symptomatic treatment using, uh, for example, antibiotics to, to treat um, uh, people who um, 
have the this disease and um, maybe the good news that the 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 toll is that that kill very less people uh, uh, <clears throat> if it comes to compare it with um, the covid for example so this is uh, the situation is the most affected country in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that is uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And at the beginning of uh, last week, there was already 1,200 uh, cases and almost uh, 60, 60 deaths due to this where, disease. And where are these figures coming from? Because um... As I understood it, the official WHO figures, um, there's only one reported death. Um, I know that this disease generally has a very low fatality rate. Um, so are these these presumably are unconfirmed um, figures? Where are they? Where are they coming from? The um, uh, sorry, uh, we we have not uh, yet uh, make investigation about the 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 origin of this uh, information but as i told you we discuss with the most important with the most important uh, medical research center in drc it is a very important uh, uh, research center and the and the this imp this research center is led by uh, uh, one of the um, one of, one of the most known African researchers who work on COVID. His name, um, I, I cannot find his, na his name this, uh, in, uh, right now, but he is very uh, popular in even in Western countries. He's known as the, uh, he has worked a lot on, co uh, on COVID and even on Ebola, Ebola disease. So um, maybe we need to, to ask them where these cases are coming so those from. those figures were from the research center. Yeah. Yes, yes. And certainly we saw with COVID how um, the official figures um, represented a much, um, uh, you know, the, the real figures uh, were much greater than the official figures that, that uh, we saw reported. Um, I get you, Anna, you've raised your hand. Yes, I did raise my hand. So I just wanted to speak on um, a vaccine. So um, in terms of, there's a study that was started in 2017, um, and it's a, it was to evaluate a certain smallpox vaccine to see if it was effective in managing monkeypox. And yes, it is effective according to the WHO, um, but they're not recommending max vaccinations yet. But there is that vaccine that perhaps that not perhaps, but that um, can be used, can be utilized to uh, manage um, sorry, monkeypox. Yeah, I know well. the WHO has put out some guidelines on that as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Bethina. I know that you've recently run a story about preparedness in the MENA region. Um, which perhaps so far is not so affected um, as, as Sub-Saharan Africa, but what can you tell us about the situation in, in Middle East and North Africa? Um, hello everybody, uh, I'm Botaina Osema, I'm the Regional Coordinator of Middle East and North Africa. Um, and actually so far we have just like 10 cases in the whole region of uh, monkey, monkey box, um, mostly in the UAE, eight cases are, are uh, confirmed in the United Arab Emirates. Um, only one case confirmed in Morocco and just yesterday, another case was confirmed in Lebanon. Um, the situation until now is um, most of the international organizations are, are assuring that it's, it's good and, and nothing to uh, fear about. Uh, also, um, a lot of assurance that uh, the preparedness of the region is uh, more effective now than before. For example, we uh, before COVID, we have like uh, four laborat 40 laboratories all over the region for uh, doing uh, uh, gene sequencing for, for different strains of viruses. But now we have 650 uh, laboratory around the region. Um, also, the, the health systems are, are more prepared now for facing um, new threats like new pandemics. 
the, pro the problem of conflict areas also is a bit uh, solved. Uh, for example, for laboratories, there is uh, an agreement now be between the different countries of the region to uh, use their laboratories um, uh, between to use different countries laboratories uh, so they can they can identify the the strains of the viruses and and to identify the confirmed cases of of uh, different diseases um uh, regarding the the vaccination uh, issue uh, as uh, Gucci mentioned that the small box uh, vaccination is still effective for for facing monkeypox. Um, countries in in our region uh, stopped vaccinating uh, for smallpox in 1980, but still there are there are uh, uh, stockpiles of of the vaccination of smallpox in in the different countries. Um, the WHO uh, regional office uh, decided that in next October they will be having a meeting uh, to decide if the countries should use this stockpiles of, of vaccination uh, of smallpox for um, uh, some of the of the um, um, different categories of people who might need this kind of vaccination, like uh, health workers and. Um, people with, with weak immu immunity. And, and so this decision is not taken yet, but by next October, they will decide if they should use this uh, stockpiles of vaccination to vaccinate people who need this kind of immunity for, for um, smallpox and for monkeypox in, in uh, sequence. Thanks, Bethina. Um Now, this current outbreak is affecting every region to one extent or another. Um, I know the Latin America and Caribbean region and um, and Asia Pacific is is less affected, but nevertheless there, there have been cases. What can um, you tell us, Louisa or Joel, about um, Louisa perhaps uh, first from okay. Latin America? So uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, I'm Luisa Masarani. I, I take care of the, the Latin American region of uh, SciDev.net. So as you mentioned, uh, the uh, monkeypox, uh, as Ruth mentioned, uh, monkeypox uh, didn't affect that much uh, Latin American yet. Uh, the first case uh, identified in, in Latin American was found in Argentina uh, at the end of May. And uh, there are a few cases in Latin America now, and actually uh, the, the numbers, the figures are not very clear. The last one that I found uh, uh, was from uh, the 10th of uh, June, but it's, uh, it's about uh, less than 10 cases identified in, in Latin America. And uh, the big, uh, this means that there, uh, there is uh, little information about the disease around and little coverage uh, uh, by the mass media uh, about the, the, the disease. Uh, the big, big, big challenge uh, nowadays is how to detect the disease. Uh, so uh, people, the, the countries, uh, the governments, the laboratories actually don't know yet how to detect uh, the disease. So one very important issue is how to train uh, the different countries to, to identify, to detect, to be able uh, to be expert in detecting that. So some training have been done in different countries by the Pan American Health Organization, for example. This means that uh, maybe the disease is around and uh, we actually uh, don't know. It's, it's still invisible. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we also know that uh, after COVID, uh, COVID well, Latin America was uh, one of the parts of the world that uh, COVID uh, reached later, for example, in comparison to, to Europe or US. And uh, then uh, when it arrived, it arrived uh, dramatically, killing um, much more people than in other parts of the world. So I think that uh, it's, uh, COVID was a, a lesson to be learned. And I hope that uh, our governments can be more prepared for uh, identifying and taking care of uh, monkeypox. Thank you, Louisa. And uh, last but not least, Joel, who is based in Manila, editor of our Asia Pacific uh, edition. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, I'm Joel Adriano, and I'm based here in Manila. So it's good evening. Uh, so I'm handling the uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, edition. 
And here, as uh, Ruth mentioned earlier, uh, there's really not much uh, cases of uh, monkeypox as of now. Uh, the only confirmed cases that we had is uh, all in Australia. And that's why whenever you ask around about uh, if they can join in the call and, and speak about the topic, it's so difficult to actually get people to, to speak on this topic because even the experts themselves, the health experts in the region, have no clue or no idea of what monkeypox is. In fact, one uh, health secretary even uh, told me uh, over the weekend that you probably, you being in the media, you probably know more than what I know. And that's why he doesn't really want to talk about uh, the topic because it's, he has more questions than he can actually provide answer uh, to this um, event today. And so uh, there's a lot of misinformation because of that. And in fact, one of the, uh, the app that is very common with misinformation is in fact TikTok. Uh, you will see a lot of misinformation over there. Uh, one of the common misinformation that is being shared is that it is caused by vaccine, specifically uh, AstraZeneca. Some, some of them cites it's probably an effect of Pfizer, but it's mostly AstraZeneca because of the name, uh, monkeypox. And uh, the, the basic um, uh, ingredient for the uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine uh, it's, it's, it's actually uh, came from a, a type of monkey. And so I think that's the sort of association that they made because of the name. And so, and, and because of that, uh, a lot of the public are kind of easily swayed, uh, especially if you're bombarded repeatedly, but by the same message. Um, and um, Another misinformation that I noticed that has been gaining momentum lately, uh, that is shared mostly in not in, in not in uh, TikTok but but in Facebook, it's on uh, related to gay people. It's it's they say that it's it's uh, it's be it's a disease, something similar when it started with AIDS that uh, more or less you'll be affected. Uh, you, you mean, that's confined within the gay community unless you're close to a gay person that you might probably get infected. And so there's lots of misinformation, again, around that. Uh, so to put that in context, this is obviously a disease where, which is spreading among um, men who have sex with men. Um, yeah, because and, of that report, yeah. Yeah. Um, which which is a fact about the transmission, but obviously there is a danger of misinformation and also stigmatization around that. Is that um, something that um, your other regions are seeing that there's um, an increased stigmatization around around this? Disease? Well, at least in the Philippines, uh, we haven't seen that yet. But there are some certain countries who has uh, you know you, you know, there's certain countries which kind of uh, stigmatize. Uh, LBQT, uh, what, what, for, I forgot the, the acronym, uh, and and that actually actually uh, increases the stigmatization because of of uh, of misinformation surrounding um, uh, monkeypox, and there are also uh, not really misinformation but lack of information whether like one one health official or no not a health official but one uh, official of a hospital was in fact uh, asking me the, just last week uh, whether they should be importing vaccine already for monkeypox. In fact, they don't know if there's a vaccine for monkeypox, but they heard there's a vaccine for monkeypox. So there are lots of types of questions like that. Or because there were, there were, there were are reports that say that most of the victims, or I think all the victims so far, or all those have been affected, are below 40 years old. And it says that because the previous gen those who are older than 40, I think, have at least uh, have been vaccinated with smallpox and that actually offers protection. And again, that's not clear. And, and that's something, again, uh, even the, the doctors, you know, some, uh, some of the health experts are, in fact, were asking around whether if that's true, 
if you don't you will be get infected if you're something like 45 or 50 years old simply because you had the smallpox vaccine before so there, there are lots of questions like that and going and and sometimes those questions that have no clear answer that that's where uh the misinformation start and, and you just need someone who actually would would use that go into a social media and then spread those misinformation and that's and we've been seeing that already thanks joe maybe some others have um some words to say about that but um let me just first say to everyone attending um please do put your questions um to our editors uh you can raise your hand or you can put a question in, in the chat um we'd love to to take questions from you directly does anyone oh julian you've raised your hand thank you Yes, thank you. Uh, just to to uh, add, add to give additional information about what what I was saying, the the information as well, uh, about the number of cases uh, registered in Democratic Republic of Congo uh, is uh, coming from the local bureau of the World Health Organization. So the local the uh, Bureau of World Health Organization based in uh, DRC. I have just uh, seen the same information in some uh, press agen agency like uh, Sun Xinhua, the press, uh, China, Chinese press agency. Um, and I was, uh, I wanted also to give you the name of the, of this professor who is leading the National in Institute of Research, of Medical Research in in Democratic Republic of Congo. His name is Jean-Jacques Muyembe. He is um, globally known uh, as a, a lead researcher about Ebola and about uh, COVID-19 in, in Africa. Thanks, Julian. That's Jean -Jacques thanks Muyembe. for that clarification. Yes. Uh, we have a question here. We heard how misinformation is rife regarding monkeypox. What can be done against this? What role does the media play in combating this misinformation? Anyone want to uh, take that one? Okay, um, let me take it. Um, I think that the role that the media has to play is the traditional role of fact checking, verifying the facts, and then speaking to experts, which is why SIDEV is, is a very crucial media organization in, in the sense that we have access to scientists and experts and the research and the science itself, and we're able to dispel myths and disinformation and the misinformation on on monkeypox um just speaking to them and, and putting the right information out there in creative ways uh and and making sure that the news go uh, what the right information the science goes out as far and, and wide as possible is one way that journalists and the media can play a crucial role in dispelling this information that is now right um regarding monkeypox anyone else want to add to that okay um I think that what uh, media can can do to to help fight uh, misinformation against this uh, disease is exactly what we su suggested um, uh, in the same situation regarding uh, COVID nineteen. It means that um, we should we should make sure we should just do our our job. We should just do our job. It means that we need to check any information to check carefully in any information before uh, publishing it and uh, the I mean, uh, today we know that social media is uh, <clears throat> taking a lot of uh, influence among uh, population in the world maybe the uh, what we we can what media can do at this at this um, level is to make sure that they also they are also very very influent on social media it means that we we should have an um, influent account and to, to make sure that uh, 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 media account on social media are uh, influent. Maybe we need to, um, to secure fund for promotion, promotion of uh, media account on social media to um, make sure that their information are uh, having uh, um, uh, uh, as widespread as other um, uh, information that are uh, running on 
on social media. And you know that uh, regarding this aspect, misinformation is, is, is taking a lot, of, a lot of advantage because uh, unfortunately people are likely to believe in misinformation uh, more than they do. In, in good information. So media needs to, from my point of view, from my, from my perspective, media organization needs to make sure that they have influence account on social media and that they promote enough these accounts so that their news reach a large number of people around the world. Thanks, Julia. And obviously this is not a problem that's been unique to monkeypox and uh, yes. I think global health authorities Kind of recommended that media don't focus in on those that misinformation even to counter it because that sort of um, propagates it um but but focuses on on reporting accurate information and uh, that's certainly what we try to do at side can i can i add something yes please but fine was that yes please, um, please. actually Thank following you. what uh, julian said i think also at some cases the the um, uh, social media is um, the source of ideas that or, or angles for our stories. So sometimes you can detect some of these rumors and misinformation that are flying um, through the social media and uh, use them as an angle for your story to follow up and clarify the, the, the misinformation that happened and, and raise more awareness about the right information that uh, the people should know and uh, to uh, convert this this kind of, of uh, flying misinformation in social media. Someone else has commented saying most of the media did not play the real situation. It's a big problem. I hope we're not counted among that <laughs> majority of the media. Some of the uh, media platforms actually, they are um, an echo of social media. So they are propagating the misinformation, not clarifying the, the right ones. This, this is a major problem. I, mm. I, I can um, agree with, with the comment actually. Mm. But, uh, but the, the um, uh, trustworthy uh, media platforms should play another role to um, fix what, what social media is doing actually. Yeah, Julian, you raised your hand. Yes, just to just to complete where, uh, what um, uh, Botana said uh, by saying that we have we have noticed that um, in in this fight against uh, misinformation, we have realized that many uh, newsrooms have developed fact checking, and I think that this is a a, a way to to fight with um, a efficacy. Um, uh, misinformation. It means that we can, uh, what journalists, what, what media can do here, are doing here is to take any information and go and uh, look if, look uh, through, through this information to see if it is true or not and come back to write an article saying that uh, the, the, the news published by, uh, published by this organization or by these people saying this or saying that this news is um, right or is not right. So fact checking is one of the uh, effective way from my point of view that we can use to, to fight against uh, misinformation. Any more questions from our audience? What do we have here? Probably just right. to add. Oh, Ruth sorry, on Joel, the... I'm just gonna take this um, question from okay. Vijay, Shank Vijay Shankar. Um, so I can't see your full name there. The pictures that go with uh, monkeypox or any health story uh, resonate with the reader. For instance, where I live in Germany, a newspaper published a picture with a group of black people in connection with a story that Omicron, uh, the COVID strain of Omicron, uh, spread out from South Africa. That kind of implies that black people were the reason for the spread. This is misinformation. I'm a journalist myself uh, and was appalled by that picture. With respect to monkeypox, pictures of black people with the pox, with the pus, pox puzzles that um, were initially published a lot across um, many media outlets, even a, a WHO pamphlet. So yeah, this is something that's been dis discussed um, widely and um in terms of yeah how this was spreading the wrong message because it's associating it um 
with Africa, whereas it's this is a global outbreak now and and so on. Um, any thoughts about that or uh, ways that yeah. you've approached this um, as editors? Yeah, uh, in fact, I was uh, that was I was uh, I saw the the <laughs> the question already, and I was actually going to uh, uh, say something about that because that's true. Actually, in fact, we we had this discussion several times whenever we post stories involving photos because the photos can actually, I mean, uh, sometimes the photos can reflect certain biases, and that's why we need to carefully select photos. And that also goes through with the way we write our headlines. So even without going through the article, uh, a lot of the mis misinformation uh, can already be, uh, or, or misjudgment can already be reflected just by having the titles and the photos. And that's why we always had this discussion with photos. Now, uh, just to inform uh, BJ, who made the comment uh, about the photos, uh, just to, for you to understand, that so, sometimes I I I know what the, the what photo you're referring to because a lot of the pub, media pub outlets actually use that. Uh, but for you to understand that the problem sometimes with photos, because the article itself it's actually a syndicated article or article uh, that was used by several outlets which came from a, a, a major uh, news outlet source and so they actually just simply use the same photo and sometimes that uh, that's a problem because you don't have you don't actually own the photos you don't have photos and so you you uh, you go to certain sites where you can uh, you you use photos that might uh, uh, sort of um, represent the topic that you are covering and that's where you should always be careful and 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 our team usually had this discussion whenever you, we use photos as for the headlines it's uh the headline sometimes can um, can actually result to disinformation and that's why it's very for, important for us to focus on uh, on high quality journalism so that uh, build trust uh, even as it attracts greater audiences because that's actually one of the the reason why we we sometimes sensationalize the the article I mean the the title also it's very important for us like uh, you know to call out fake or or call out fake news or disinformation and avoid legitimizing them sometimes when we we cover it repeatedly. Uh, it actually results to um, several major organizations covering the same fake news. And instead of actually making it a sort of uh, emphasizing the fake news, it becomes a legitimate source of, uh, 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 it becomes a legitimate article in a sense because a lot of uh, news outlets actually cover the same thing. And, and so that's why we have to be very careful in, in covering the same topics over and over again. Thanks, Joel. Thank BJ's actually added to that um, a comment about how Africa actually leads the fight against monkeypox, as we heard from um, the recent side of um, uh, Africa Focus podcast, um, and is, and says we need to amplify such discussions. Well, that's what we we certainly hope to do with that. So thank you, and thank you for that um, nice comment afterwards. I'm all for side of net's way of coverage i love it <laughs> thank you vj because the conversation here i mean just shows how important media media literacy campaigns uh, are it's important for um the masses to be able to filter the news that they take in uh, and so maybe media literacy at this point is something that we as the media can take on while well, educating people on uh, and how to filter the news that they consume, how to fact check themselves, like little tips on how to do these things so that they're getting the right information. And then in terms of reporting, um, um, reporting news about monkeypox from Africa and sort of resisting racist portrayals, it might be important. I think that what, what is needed is like finding the balance in um, reporting the disease as a black people only disease or something, or you know, just finding the balance 
the important is so that it doesn't fuel racism, but also um, reporting learnings from countries that have insight into the disease because it existed there, it was endemic in the country, in these countries before this most recent outbreak. Um, so it's maybe just the way that we've um, covered it at SIDEV is um, explaining, uh, uh, talking to experts from the region um, in terms of, and, and then letting us know what they've done or some of the uh, studies that have been carried out um, into monkeypox into monkey and how smallpox. So they were the ones who led, who, well, who led research into smallpox vaccines and how it's effective for uh, monkeypox as well. So reporting in that light can sort of reduce well, racist portrayals of monkeypox, perhaps, I think. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? Um... I have actually a question, both as a journalist and as a regular reader or consumer of Cytopnet. Um, has has uh, Kavi or Cytopnet uh, thought about, um, you know, uh, doing uh, some sort of transmedia approach, you know, uh, to uh, publish part of content or, you know, as, as stories? Um, one form of a story for uh, the you know readers and and converting um, the the written story into into immersive audio experience for uh, those regions where radio uh, dominates. You know, then we the, the site of net uh, as a site will have a better reach. Um, you know, because the, the, the site works for uh, people whose um, voices are not heard loud enough. And uh, in a way to, to amplify those voices is to make more people uh, read or consume uh, site of Net's content. So what has uh, the team thought about uh, along these lines to, to amplify uh, the reach of the content? Thanks, Vijay. So this um, is something that we've we've discussed actually, but um, it's not got any further than discussions. And we we always um, welcome funding to uh, to fund such ambitious projects. Um, but um, certainly, the nearest we do to that at the moment is our podcasts, which do go out on radio um, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, both in English and, and French. I don't know whether our managing editor, Ben, wants to add anything to that. Hi, um, thanks for the question, VJ, and good to hear from you. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's something we've talked about. We've got our radio podcasts, which we use to access radio. So we produce the podcast. We then have partnerships with the radio stations. That's working really well for us. But we have talked a lot about whether we should have audio versions of our articles. Um, I know there's a plugin which we had a meeting with the people who run that plugin to talk about that. So it's a work in progress and we're coming up to a, a redesign of the site. And certainly it's one of the ideas that we've got floating around. So watch this space. And uh, yeah, that could, I think I, I agree with you, BJ. I think it's a really important functionality. Great to hear that, Ben. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks, VJ. It's great to have you participating. So, oh, Julian, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, yes, thank you, Ruth. Maybe um, uh, to, to try a, a sort of answer to Sila's question, I will just uh, want to say that as uh, we saw with uh, COVID-19, we should know that it is going to be it. It, it is going to be very difficult to have the exact uh, data in Africa because there are a lot of underreported cases in the villages where uh, uh, there are not uh, possibility to report cases to, to the authorities. And also um, uh, it, is on, it is only now that um, people have um, uh, resumed to, 
to go to the hospital in Africa because you know during COVID-19 there was a lot of misinformation here saying that when you go to the hospital even if you don't have COVID if you, if you don't have if you have only malaria the doctors are going to say that you have uh, COVID-19 and if you died from from this disease, from your disease your your body will not uh, will not be given to your family so this uh, sort of mis misinformation in our regions uh, um, brought to a situation where people did no longer go to the to the hospital. So um, uh, regarding COVID-19, uh, we have a lot of underreported cases in Africa. So the data that were uh, published regarding uh, Sub-Saharan Africa were not uh, surely the exact data that we, we have. They, they, they were not reflecting the exact situation of the disease in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm afraid it would also be the case for um, monkeypox, as we know that monkeypox is a disease who, that is affecting a lot of people in rural uh, region, in uh, where uh, sometimes there are no electricity, there are no uh, there are no radio, there are no hospital, and most of people may. Uh, have the disease and their cases uh, are not going to be reported to the authorities and most of the people may die from the diseases and the, these cases are not going to be uh, reported to the authorities so uh, to conclude i will say that the data there we will have data in africa but it is important to uh, keep in mind that these data are not uh, reflecting the real situation that in in most of the case the real situation is, is worse that that uh, than what we have in the data thanks julia and of course that's where the need for surveillance comes in and we'll be publishing an article on that later today so on a sub-saharan africa edition so do look out for that um i'm afraid that's all we've got time for this morning as i say we'd love your feedback do put any comments in the chat um as we wind up now um both on this session and anything that you might be interested in hearing about um, or speaking to us about in future um, calls. Thank you everyone um, for joining us and thanks to all our editors for your contributions too. Have a good day.